This is the Apostle Peter, this book that we're addressing, working on. Uh, Apostle Peter, if you remember, was the apostle that received the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Back in Matthew 16, when Jesus had asked the question, who do men say that I am? And, who, and then he said, who do you say that I am? And he said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter had been given the keys to the kingdom. Of course, we use that often when we talk about Peter. We talk about salvation. We talk about the things that are involved with salvation. It was Peter on the day of Pentecost that would preach. It was Peter on the day of Pentecost that would respond to the question, men and brother, what shall we do? Amen. And we have, you go up all the way up to chapter 12 of Acts, you're, you're going to be reading about Peter. He seems to be the main character. In chapter 12 of Acts, Peter is uh, in prison. And uh, when God wants you out of prison, nobody can keep you in prison. Hallelujah. I mean, they had him chained to guards behind iron doors. It didn't matter. Hallelujah. God, God who does the impossible. And step into any situation. Are you hearing me this morning? No matter what you're dealing with, if God wants you out of it, you're going to get out of it. You understand? You're going to get out of it. He is going to bring you out. Amen. Hallelujah. So now sometimes God lets us go through things, teach us something. You know, and some of us are, some of us have had to take the class more than once. You know, and sometimes say, dear God, don't, don't bring that class back by again. I really learned this time, honestly, Lord. Honestly, I learned. <laughs> Please don't let me run through this again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Peter, as you as we've talked about in the past, was the apostle that carried the message to uh, to the the Jewish believer or the Jewish uh, unbeliever. Jewish unbeliever would believe in one God, but would not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Much the same today. There are Jews that believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And there are many, many, many Jews that do not believe that he is the Messiah. So when you read First Peter, he, he is addressing those that have been dispersed of, of the Jews. Uh, and again, many of them have been saved. They, have, they know Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Amen. And they have placed their faith, their trust, their hope in him. They, through faith, have been obedient to whatever God's requirements are. Hey, do you know that God has requirements? Did you know that? You know, what was the requirement in the garden? Don't eat from that tree. You can eat from every tree in the garden but that one. You know. What was the requirement for Noah? You got to build an ark. No, if you don't build the ark, you're going to drown with the rest of the humanity. You know. God convinced him he built an ark. And, and, and so in, in every age, there's, there's requirements. Amen. And so, so when Peter addresses the believers, we're, we're going back to verse 2. I think we're going to focus. I, I skipped this last week, but I think we're going to go back and focus. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to. Uh, verse 2 says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. We've spent time talking about the elect, the chosen of God, and that God, there's a foreknowledge of God. And, and then, again, we didn't really address sanctification of the Spirit. Uh, let me just say this in passing today. Uh, sanctification is a process. There is what we call positional sanctification. Just, just hang out with me. Positional sanctification is I come in, I'm a drunk. God, God deals with my heart. I repent of my sins. I see my need of being baptized in Jesus' name. I get baptized. And when I come up out of the water, God fills me with the Holy Ghost. I begin to speak in tongues. I'm, I'm, I'm positionally sanctified. That means, that means that right now I am a child of God. You know, I, I, in fact, you, you have nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ. You see, you got to understand that. You don't make people a child of God. God does that. Okay, so I'm a positional child of God, which means when I walk out of the doors that night, I'm, I belong to Jesus. I'm, I'm his son. Okay, 
No matter what you think of me, it matters what he thinks of me. Okay, and so, in fact, in Colossians, Paul will say, he's taken us out of darkness into marvelous, well, that's Peter, again, he will take us out of darkness, the, the kingdom of Satan. You're right, it's the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of light, the light of his dear son. So we, we, we've changed positions, you see. Now, so there's positional sanctification, and then there is the process of sanctification. God has ordained, okay, he has predetermined that we are going to be conformed to the image of his son. Okay. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm in that process. I mean, I have good days, you know. Not every day is like Wednesday when I call my wife a name. You had to be here. I'm not telling you what that name was. You'd have had to have been here. If you weren't here, that's your deal, not mine. You know, hallelujah. You know, I have days like that. And, and, and days where I, I realize, you know what? Should have kept my mouth shut. Blurted stuff out, shouldn't have said. I, I, okay, let me, for you people, I don't swear, all right? When I get man- angry, I don't swear. Because that's the old life, and God has cleansed that garbage out of me. All right? Now, I can tell you this much, <clears throat> that when I wasn't serving God, I had two languages. <clears throat> and I'm not talking about speaking in tongues. I had the language I spoke around my wife, and I had the factory language, all right, which I didn't speak around my wife. And when I came back to God, when I came back to God, and I, and I came up to this altar one night on a Sunday night, and I was just praying. Have you ever tried to pray in every cuss word that you've been saying running through your mind? Ain't that a horrible feeling? My God, I was, I'm praying, I'm thanking God, and there are words that I, I haven't uttered them with the lips. But I, I, and I'm fighting, I'm fighting through this stuff, you know. And, and you know what, I, I really didn't feel real holy at that moment. I tell you the truth. In fact, I felt like a, pretty much of a, a worm in a dog, man. You know, God, you know, first of all, they don't know what I'm thinking, but you, you know what, you know what's going on in my mind, God. You know what's going on, and, and it bothered me. Now that stuff doesn't bother me today. And if you find yourself picking up words you shouldn't be saying, maybe you ought to review what you're watching and what you're listening to, because what you eat, what you absorb into your life, Amen, can bleed back out. So if you're watching stuff where they're doing a lot of cussing and swearing and all kinds of stuff going on, and you find yourself, you know, you just, man, you just been eating at the wrong table. You need to get up from that table and go eat at the right table. You understand what I'm saying? Do I need to go any farther than that? <clears throat> Hallelujah. You see what happens? Under stress, the real you comes out. We're all good church folks today. But don't mess with church folks when they get angry. Because the real person comes out then. <clears throat> you know, it's like they take the zipper, zip it down, and what steps out? My God, it's Satan himself. <laughs> 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 Hallelujah. And so, God is sanctifying us. You know, now, in, in our life, in our life, we have weaknesses, all right? Every one of us in this room has weaknesses. And if you say, well, I got no weaknesses. Okay. First word that comes in my mouth is you're an idiot. But that's really not really good to say, you know, because I probably just offended somebody. We all got weaknesses, okay? And, and you need to know what your weakness is. Some of us, our weakness is we have a hard time controlling our temper. All right. And, and to use the, well, that's just the way I am, that's a bunch of hogwash. That's just the way you want to be. All right? You can bring, you got the Holy Ghost, you can bring that under control. You know, the Bible speaks of temperance and self-control and, you know, and, and all this business. So, the, so whatever, wherever 
we're weak, and I'm sure it's not the same, you know. Some of you love liver, but that's not one of my weaknesses. <laughs> You'll never be able to tempt me with liver. Not a chance. My God, I'll turn up my nose. But if you bring a nice cheeseburger along, <laughs> you may have me. Hallelujah, you understand? So we all got weaknesses. And so what God does is he will speak to our weaknesses, all right, with the expectation, let me repeat that, with the expectation that we're going to do something about it. Now, I'm going to tell you, you've been in the church a long time. You ought to be better than you were when you came in, you understand? You know, it's just, it's a fact of life. It's the truth. Anything we've, anything we've done in our life. The first time I tried to play basketball, my, my son sent me a text some time ago. My youngest, Aaron, he's playing basketball this year. And the, the final score was 14 to 2. Amen. He, said, he, he says there was a lot of double dribbles and a lot of walking with the ball. You know, and then Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. Double dribbles and walking with the ball. Yeah, you know. And he said it was hilarious. But you see what's going to happen. They're going to learn. Now, now, if you're 18 years old and you're still double dribbling and, and, and you're still traveling, got your two suitcases and moving down the court, uh, you ain't going to be the first guy picked on the team. I can just tell you that right now. You understand? So what happens over time, we improve. We get better. That's how it is. So what I'm trying to tell you here, as a babe, you have a tendency to mess up. There are things where you, you do things wrong. And we say, well, that, he's a babe. He's a baby. She's a baby in the church. She's learning. We don't criticize them. We don't condemn them. Let me run that by you again. We don't criticize. We don't condemn. Now, you ain't going to like this part. We just clean them up. And I'm not talking about, okay, you shouldn't do that again. No, we just get the wipes out. Hallelujah. Amen. You guys, you guys that have children today are so lucky, so fortunate. I still remember the cloth diapers. I am forever scarred with cloth diapers. Yeah. That's it. That's you, some of you don't even know what you're doing. You don't even know what he's doing. You got it made. You you, you you roll the thing up and you toss it away. Ooh. Well, you want to know, ooh, you just go rinse him in the toilet sometime. All right, so, so we, we clean them up. And we set them up and kiss them <clears throat> on the cheek. Okay, and uh, they go on. Now, some of us have been in the house of God and the kingdom of God for a long time. We ain't using the wipes on you no more. We're using the belt on you. You know why? Because you know better. You've been in this thing too long to not know better. And you already got, you should have got past that point a long time ago. You understand what I'm saying? But some of us don't like the belt. We don't understand that the Bible says, whom he loves, he chastens. We don't get that part. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not getting into correcting your children or anything that today. I just, so, so the sanctification process involves, I mean, the cleaning up and over time, it all depends on where you're at. You know, you can get by as a child when you're small saying no to mommy and and acting rebellious, amen, and then grinning at mommy and mommy says, oh, you're so cute. But when you're 14 and doing that, Jack, you ain't cute no more. You is not cute. In fact, everybody sort of hates you. And, and, and the pastor, he says, man, man, I just, I got to go pray because what's in me, I want to take a, I want to hang them up on a hook somewhere and just leave them with their legs kicking up like that. Okay, I'm back, I'm back, I'm better now. Just the, just the thought was enough to help me. You see, I'm in a sanctification process trying to get better. 
Okay, and then, <clears throat> so there's that process of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, the, the final, the final is when we walk down the aisle with Jesus. And he's waiting for us at the end of the aisle. And, and we're pure and we're white and we're clean and we're coming home forever. That's the end of that process. All right. I, I was going to oh, see how it's going to be. Of course, let me not spend any time again in the area of obedience. Uh, you only, I'm just say this much, you only believe as much as you obey. The devil knows the word of God. The devil believes in the existence of God. He's frightened to death of God. But he does not obey God. Ladies and gentlemen, you may say you have faith. But when God deals with your heart about something and you do not act, you see, the action is the obedience. So the Apostle Paul talks about, uh, I mean, again, in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience. And then this is where I was going today. And the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, just, just hang out with me. Praise God. Praise God. Remember, his audience is a Jewish audience. They understand all this stuff. Let, let's go back. Yeah, Reggie, if you would go to Exodus 24. Exodus 24, verse 7. Exodus 24, verse 7. Let's just go, let's just go back for a moment. You know, while, while you're turning there, Exodus 24, 7, you see the first hint that God was going to use blood was when he clothed Adam and Eve, all right, in the garden. And the Bible says he took skins and he clothed. In fact, in some version it says he put long tunics on them. All right. The fact that he uses skins indicates to us that something died. Blood was shed. Again, in chapter 4, you see, amen, that when Abel brings a sacrifice, he doesn't bring the, the fruit of the ground. He brings the lamb. Okay. And blood there is shed. So there, there are hints throughout the word of God that, that God has involved blood okay, okay, as a part of the salvation of mankind. So in Exodus chapter 24, verse 7, Moses has received the law of God, the covenant. The Bible says, verse 7, then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, all right? And when they, now, you, you understand, preach has been going on a lot longer than you've been around. We're going all the way back to the Old Testament, all right? We're going back when God's law was first given. And Moses read to them, the law. have you ever read the law? My God, I'm, I'm, I jump up and down for joy when I read the law. You know, I really, no, I don't. I'm always so thankful in my daily, my yearly Bible reading. I'm thankful to get out of Leviticus. Hallelujah. And I'm thankful to get out of parts of Numbers. And Deuteronomy's coming. I know after that, man, we're clean and green. Hallelujah. But there's important, you know, I'm, I'm, one, of these day, one of these days, I'm going to preach on the burden of the Kohathites. Hallelujah. And I got that out of the... Out of stuff you'd never think of getting it out of, you know. But it just it it it, it hit me. All right, all right. So, so they hear the reading of the law, and then it says they said, "All that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient." So they they demonstrated faith, did they not? And then the Bible says, "And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant.'" which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Amen. What, what we just read there in Exodus, this was the inauguration, all right, of the law of Moses. And the children of Israel pledged obedience to 
the law. Hallelujah. Now, just, just hang out with it. We, we, we're not going to spend a lot of time in the Old Testament here. Amen. If you were to be in, we're not going to go there, but Leviticus 7, uh, verse 14 talks about, amen, when there's, this, when there's a peace offering. Amen. He's going to sprinkle the peace offering with blood. When you're dealing with the, the leprosy, and you go to chapter 16 uh, of Leviticus, it deals with leprosy, and, and again, you will hear about the, the sprinkling of the blood. All right, now just stay with me. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13, if you'd go there with me, amen. Come on, this, this is, yeah, the devil hates this stuff, man. Hates this stuff. He knows the power that has come through the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. He knows. Praise God. He understands. And he is afraid of people who understand what the blood of Jesus Christ has done for them. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says in verse 13, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifer sprinkling the unclean sacrifice for the purifying of the flesh... If it purified the flesh, okay, with the ashes of a heifer and the sprinkling of the blood, if it sanctified it, verse 14, how much more? Oh, you ought to get that in your mind and your spirit. How much more? I feel just a rush of God's spirit. Shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. How much more? If animal blood and the ashes of a heifer purified in the Old Testament, how much more? Amen. The blood of Jesus Christ, amen, will purify us. Amen. Come on. As a believer, you ought to not be walking around with a guilty conscience. There's three types of guilt. Let me start with the worst. There's neurotic guilt. That's a person that's always guilty. They beat themselves to death. They don't even need a devil. They're their own worst enemy. Neurotic guilt. Then there is Guilt that Satan brings. All right. His purpose of guilt is to condemn you. And by condemning you, he paralyzes you. By condemning you, you get the sense of, I'm not worthy to come into God's presence. I'm a dog. Amen. I can't even worship God because of what I am. That's what Satan loves to do. And then there's the guilt that God brings. And when God brings guilt, yeah, you do feel conviction. But let me run it by you again. I've said it many times. I'll say it again. I have never changed until God first convicted me. And the purpose of that conviction is to bring me to change. And will bring me back to the blood, and to what Jesus did for me at the cross. And when I go to him, let me just read it to you. It's later on in my notes here. Amen. 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sin, if is a conditional word, word, he is, everybody say he is, faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me, cleanse me, Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Therefore, if I've come to him in honesty and truth, amen, and say, God, forgive me. I was a real bonehead. I shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have did that. Forgive me, Father. And he says, Son, I forgive you. My blood covers it. Now, you have no longer any right to discuss that issue with Satan. And he has no right to bring it up, although he will. And you have no right to carry that around and allow it to hinder your relationship with God. 
Let me put it like this. Did, did your mother ever give you instructions in the house of what you were not supposed to do? Okay, I, I, I don't know if you ever did this, but, you know, sometimes mom's got her favorite vase or a lamp. And, you know, you got brothers and, you know, you, you, you got this story already in his mind. You know, you know, maybe tossing the ball, the football or something, and mom's not there, and all of a sudden, crash. It's on the floor. It's broke. You know, that's probably the first time that you don't have to be told to clean up something you've done wrong. Because <laughs> you try to glue it back together, fix it up. When that doesn't work, you carry it. You, you've had to be told to carry stuff to the to the garbage can before you carry it to the garbage and you bring a sack of garbage that was by the kitchen door waiting to go out there and you put the lamp underneath and you put the baggage on top and you walk back in the house and then mama walks to the door and she can't even find you you're down in the far recesses of the house you're in the basement in the corner and then you hear Leo but you got brothers that's sweet. Derek did it. <laughs> Derek did what? He did it. He broke the lamp. You broke my favorite. Oh, I thought you were talking about my lamp. Now we're really in trouble. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, what we do, what we do, you see, when we've done wrong and God convicts us, it immediately alters our relationship with him. Immediately. We don't feel like we can come into his presence. We, we, we get the weight of what we've done. It weighs on us. Amen. And then, But when we go to God and ask his forgiveness, now he removes it. And here's we've got to also remove it. If we don't remove it, it's going to affect our relationship with our Father. You understand what I'm saying? We just read a scripture that said, Amen. Through the blood of Jesus, amen, we don't have an issue with the conscience. If you've come to God in all honesty and truth, and you've asked Him to forgive you, you should no longer have an issue with your conscience. It should be cleansed. And if you keep bringing up the past, it suggests to us that your faith is not real strong in that area. It suggests that you don't quite understand the purpose of Calvary and the blood. And when you're, when you're vulnerable like that, the enemy takes advantage of that. Whatever you do, don't agree with the enemy. You've got to learn to discern his voice. Turn your neighbor and say, you've got to discern his voice. That's the truth. Not everything that speaks to you is God. Some people seem to think God's talking all the time. He ain't talking all the time. In fact, the way some people say what God's saying, God's got, he's a little bit neurotic himself. Because he seems to be constantly changing his mind when it comes to you. He just can't seem to make up his mind. God doesn't have that issue. That issue's us, not God. So what's it tell me? We are not really hearing from God. This is really going far. Be careful what you say that God said to you. You may want to preface some things with, I believe God's talking to me about this. But when you start saying, thus said the Lord, and it wasn't the Lord, that's not a good position to be in. In the Old Testament, God says, you talk like that, you can get stoned to death. It, it, it must have been terrible, you can read in the book of Ezekiel, when the, when, the, when the priest and the prophets were prophesying peace, and God says, you know what, I don't know who they've been listening to, I didn't say that. You understand? So be, you know, you better be careful. You better examine what you feel God's talking to you. Now, 
am I saying that God doesn't talk? I'm not saying that. He does talk to us. But you just better be careful. You know, some of us are, whether we realize that we're open to suggestion. We, got, we, get, we get a preacher on the television or somebody on the radio. We read somebody and, my God, all of a sudden God has suggested. And we're just, we're just repeating what God is supposed to have said to somebody else. The Bible says test the spirits. It says to prove all things. Some things we just, we just want it because we like it. And, and we just, well, we're not, we're not running that by the acid test. Why aren't you running by the acid? Because I like it. It's, it spoke to me and it was good and I felt good about it. Why is it that when God speaks to some people, he never has anything to say about how they're behaving? You ever notice that? With some people. I mean, God never corrects them for anything. I would to God that God would correct them. <laughs> they never hear from God when it comes to correction. All they ever hear is the good stuff. I think you got your hear- hearing aid turned down too low. You better turn it up a little bit to hear it. Because you know what? Because the God I serve, I- I- okay, I'm just, can I be transparent here? Most of the time he talks to me, he's talking to me about, I need to do something about what I'm doing. And he's not real pleased with me at that moment. I made some people feel real good. Yeah, the pastor's got a problem. I feel much better now. (laughs) I'll tell you what. I want him to talk to me. And he can tell me whatever he wants to tell me. What I'm afraid of is he may quit talking to me. And so when I do wrong, I want to say, Mark, you did wrong. You need to do something about it, son. I want to hear from him. And if that's all I ever hear from him, quite frankly, that's okay. Now, I do want to hear the prophetic spoken into my life about the good stuff. But amen. But I don't want to miss when he speaks to me and says, Son, you shouldn't have said that. You should have not did that. Amen. You are out of line. Hallelujah. My, my God. I'm talking about the blood, but I'm just on the sideline here, going somewhere. So obviously, obviously right now in this room, God is talking to somebody. And he's trying to straighten some stuff out in you. Are you willing to listen and to hear what he would speak to you? Get out of the fantasy world. Have you ever noticed in the fantasy world that all men are handsome and all women are beautiful? And in the fantasy world, every woman worships you. (laughs) That is not real. And every man thinks you're a babe. That is not real. That's a fantasy. Well, we sure love our fantasies. We do. I'm I'm telling you right now. Come on, there's more than one person in this room that you do a lot of daydreaming, and in that daydream, you're in Hawaii, you're sitting on the beach, amen, you got fruit, you got got a lemonade, you got whatever, you got an umbrella, amen, you you got the soft music playing, the surf, my God. And then hubby walks to the door, hey, what's for supper? I was doing so good. And then reality walked through the door. And I hate it. (laughs) It's the truth. Come on. (laughs) Don't live in fantasy. It's dangerous. It's disillusional. It'll mess you up. It'll give you a wrong perspective. Hallelujah. And then when God speaks to you in reality, well, God don't love me. God doesn't care about me. Look, look he, if God loved me and cared about me, he wouldn't talk to me about what I need to do differently. Yes, he would talk to you about what you need to do differently. So get out of the fantasy world. 
and join the rest of us folks is, that is just trying to walk through life. Hallelujah. Living for the Master. Living in manure up to our elbows sometimes. You ever, you ever been there? Maybe some of you have. Living with people's crud. My own crud's bad enough. Living with yours just makes it worse. Saying to the Lord, how long, my God, how long? Even so, come Lord Jesus. Are you still with me? And it's, we went from talking about guilt to, amen, to get where we're at. I'm just, brothers and sisters, if you saw what I see sometimes from where I'm standing right now in this house, I can see the oppression. I can see, amen, that heaviness that the enemy has put on people. And it, much of it is in the mind. Amen. And they have told God they're sorry for the same sin 35 times. And they somehow don't believe that God forgave them. You understand? You are living on the wrong side of the cross. You're living on the side that the Egyptian soldiers are on. You need to cross over in your mind and watch the enemy float in the water. You understand what I'm saying to you? What side are you choosing to live on today? We've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. How much more? So His blood cleanse us. Sanctify us. I don't go around with a guilty conscience anymore. I know what to do when I've done wrong. Hallelujah. And you see... When Moses in Exodus 24, when he sprinkled the blood of that covenant, it was merely a harbinger of what was to come. Y'all understand what I say? It was a sign of what was coming down the road. Hallelujah. In Matthew 26 and 26, if I just, if you'll let me go there, just let me spend a little bit more time in this area. Hallelujah. Matthew 26 and 26. Jesus is at that last supper with his disciples and they're fussing over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And he's looking around saying, who's going to be with me before this night's over? In fact, he himself has already said that they're all going to scatter. And he's going to be alone, alone. Amen. And he's going to go out in the garden. He's going to say to him, would you not pray with me one hour? He's going to come back from prayer and he's all sleeping. And he said to them in verse 26, For this is my blood of the new... Everybody, what's it say? What's it say next? 26, 26. For this is my what? 26, 26. Go down to 28 then. I'm messed up here. Ah, there it is. You got a pen? I got a change up here. I might know. That's what happens when you don't, that's what happens when you don't use your Bible. Thank you, brother. Thank you. For this is the blood of my what? New covenant or New Testament? You understand, I am no longer under the old covenant. I'm under a new covenant. This is the blood of my new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So when Peter writes to the believing Jew, he talks about the sprinkling. Of the blood of Jesus. It don't take them much to understand. That he just took them back. Amen. To Exodus 24. Where they were first inaugurated into that old covenant. Or the covenant of the law. Amen. But now they're not under the covenant of the law. They're under a new covenant. Turn your name and say I'm under a new covenant. I can eat bacon now. If I want to. Hallelujah. You don't want to eat bacon? That's fine. Don't eat it. Don't bother me in the least. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 11.25. You know, I got to quit here. Go, go, forget that. Forget that, brother. But you can read it later. 1 Corinthians 11.25. Go with me to Hebrews 9.18. Hallelujah. 
Just let me read here, and this is where I'm going to finish. Hebrews 9, 18. It says, therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. We just read it back in Exodus. Hallelujah. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Then likewise he sprinkled the blood with the blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Hallelujah. Go to Hebrews 10, verse 19. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's where I'm going to end. So when it talks about, amen, when Paul, Peter says the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, it's a metaphor. It's drawing on the account that happened back at Mount Sinai. Praise God. You don't literally get sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Amen. It dried up a long time ago when that cross has been buried. I don't even know what's happened to it. It's, this is an issue of faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by what? The blood of Jesus. I'm not afraid. When I do wrong, I go to him. He forgives me. I have access to come into his presence. I don't come with my shoulders down, drooping, say, I'm a dog here. No, I'm a son. I've been washed. I've been cleansed. I'm wonderful. I'm likable. I'm lovable. I am. It don't matter what you think. It matters what he thinks. Hallelujah. So I boldness to enter the holies by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. I'll go to one more. Hebrews 12, 24, and this is where I'm in then. I don't got time to do all the rest. I got to quit. I'm, I'm on overtime now. My pay just went up. Hallelujah. I get triple time now. Praise God. Praise God. Helen, what's triple from nothing, Leo? Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> All right, I, no, it's not really like that. All right, amen. So you get this picture of heaven, and it says to Jesus, the mediator of what? The new covenant. You understand what mediation's all about? Like you know, he says, like a lawyer. You know, Father, here's Mark. I washed him. I cleansed him in the blood. He's your son now. He can come into your presence. Praise God. The mediator of a new covenant. And to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Abel's blood, blood spoke from the ground and it demanded justice. Jesus' blood spoke from a cross and demanded mercy. Let's stand this morning in this room. Hallelujah. I'm washed. I'm cleansed. I'm justified. I can lift my hands and praise him today. I may have done stuff I shouldn't have done this week. But I've cleared it with my boss. I've cleared it with the one that died for me on the cross. And he said, son, I wash you. Just don't do that stuff no more. Quit doing it. Hallelujah. I said, I'm going to do it by the grace of God and by your spirit, Father. Hallelujah. And so I can come into his presence today. We're just fixing to have some worship here and praise in just a few moments. We're going to pray before this morning's all done. And we can come into his presence. You have the right as his child to come into the presence of the king because of blood. Hallelujah. Let's thank him right now for what he's done for us. Let's thank him right now for what he's done for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. I'm washed. I'm cleansed. I don't have to carry, amen, stuff in my conscience anymore. I don't. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen.